here with Ryan again. Hi. <laughs> we were just having a conversation and the topic we want to talk about today is kind of acting and the psychology of acting and getting into people's characters. Mm. And then we started having a conversation about about the <laughs> one of the ways Ryan earned money when he was at uni. And no, it's not bad. <laughs> talk about what it was. It's not that particular job that you're thinking about, listeners. This particular job is uh, when they get the medical students to start advancing on through their course, you need to be able to test them on their ability to engage with a, uh, a patient with, with diligence and, and, you know, compassion. So and what empathy. they do, yes. empathy, yeah. So what they would do is they get the acting students a few buildings over to come in and pretend to be patients. You get given a script. You know, you'd be like, hello, my name is Esther. I'm an 83 year old lady. I have type two diabetes and, a, a, you know, a, a clotting disorder or something like that. You, you'd come in and you you'd have all these symptoms to remember. But what you were supposed to do is mark them on their ability to engage with you in a, in a way that, that is comforting to you as a patient who has something wrong. With you, right. And we were just saying that um, even when a lot of these all of these students knew that this was an active test of their ability to engage, they were still pretty terrible, honestly. You'd come out of the first round, which had about 10 or 12 students, and you turn to your fellow, you know, actors, and you'd be like, am I being too harsh? Am I expecting too much of these medical students that they should be able to, you know, A, make eye contact, B, pause to allow you to consider your inevitable demise? You know, C, actually be able to engage when you say, is there something wrong with me? But many of them were just, it was all about, you know, symptoms. It was a numbers game, if you, if you get my meaning. So and it was, the problem is that's how Medicare does it as well. Medicare creates a numbers game. It's not a people game. It's a numbers game. That one came up a bit out of right field for me. What, what, where, where does, how does, how does Medicare come into this? I'm very, very curious. <laughs> <laughs> who was I talking, I can't remember who I was talking to the other day. And they pointed out that doctors, when you go to see a GP, they're given 10 minutes with each patient. And for example, mm. when you have to go and have blood tests, the doctors need to give a really good reason why they want mm -hmm. those blood tests. So there's basic blood tests that you can have every year as you get older. But if they want more than those basic blood tests, they've got to give a reason for it. And if they cannot give a reason based on your medical history, they're penalised for it. So it's less about the people and more about the numbers. That was where I was coming from with it. Okay, yeah, no, I, I get that. I get that. So, <laughs> so the restrictions placed on Medicare require the doctors to be actively callous. But disassociate to... from the patient yeah. as a person. Yeah. That's what no, it's, it, they're required yeah. to complete a task, not no, empathize. I've, I've had a lot of discussions with my friends recently who are American about the American healthcare system and, you know, comparing it to, for instance, Medicare, which agreed is not perfect, but it is so much better. <laughs> so much better than the American healthcare system. So I, I wondered where that was going. Now that's agreed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, look, I am 100% behind free medical for everybody. Absolutely. Yes. I, I do not like the American system at all. Bit of a socialist in that regard, people. <laughs> well, it's my opinion, and we're getting a little bit off track here, but I do want to state it before we keep going. It's my opinion that for, for any country to grow, you need um, utilities, uh, education, and medical to run at a loss, basically, in order for a, a country to thrive properly. Those three things are required because everything else is the stuff that produces money. Those three things are the basic human rights and an educated healthy and well-fed slash sheltered population can only benefit a country really when you look at it it's mm. just very expensive anyway let's not go anyway, into socialism listeners. Let's we're not, not here get... for that. <laughs> <laughs> we've done politics a few times we're here for other things uh one of which is uh the fact that 
uh, I think medicine in being turned into into a real science and, and psychology by extension, which is you know a problematic because we really don't have enough data to turn psychology into a science. We're learning new things every week, really. Um, but the more it's turned into a science, the more it is taught as a simple set of of numbers and graphs and and you know bell curves. The more it's about uh, testing a person's ability to memorize things rather than their ability to engage with people. And it really, really showed when we did these assessments with the, with the students, because at, at most, of them, honestly, and I do mean most of them would fail. <laughs> that impact their final marks, do you know? It has a little bit of an impact. It's not a make or break. <laughs> Because they, they do it a couple of times. So you get the the early ones and then I think there's a second one. There might even be a third one. I wasn't paying too much attention, listeners. This was a second year uni, which meant that I had stopped caring too much about marks and started caring a lot more about what I would do in my free time, which meant that more often than not, I would show up to these things a little bit hungover and having crammed these these details into my memory the, the morning of. But still... <laughs> as, as a family, we got several surprises when a photograph of Ryan with a cast on his arm or his leg in plaster was posted onto social media. I can neither confirm nor deny, mainly because my memories of the times aren't, aren't very strong. I can say I wasn't as bad as some of my friends, which is, you know, something, isn't it? So let's talk about continue with that and talk about the psychology of acting because one of the things that we um, were talking about last week and failed because my internet was dropping in and out, we started talking about how actors have to, and this is where psychology comes in, isn't it? Actors have to be the person that they're portraying. And how difficult is that? And the impact that it has on the actor when they're portraying somebody who really isn't who they are. A baddie, for example. Yes. <laughs> there are several questions there. Just I let's, I'm trying to decide which one to tackle first. I think the most important one, and we again, it was something that we covered before we had to, to scuttle the last ship this conversation was on is that there's there's really two kinds of actors. There is the actor who can portray a great variety of characters. These these actors like, for instance, most, most famous options are Johnny Depp or Heath Ledger or Margot Robbie. They've honed their ability to act as being different people, uh, which is what everyone expects when they hear the word actor. But there are other actors uh, who will star in the largest Hollywood blockbusters, you know, famous examples are Sylvester Stallone or um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who can go into different movies and play the same person. Generally speaking, that person is them, but they have honed their ability to portray a particular kind of personality that people really, really enjoy to watch. So they don't really need to change up who they want to play. In fact, Ryan Reynolds is, an, is a good example of that as well, isn't he? Yes, he is. It's kind yeah. of when they get typecast. Even Russell Crowe gets typecast a bit. It happens. And you can understand it mm. from a certain perspective because typecasting someone means you know they can do the job. And, you know, having archetypes in your plays or your movies is a very handy thing to have because the audience will expect certain things of certain archetypes. It's a basis of a whole field of theatre is the concept of character, character archetypes. If you've got someone who can do that, great, just cast them. But if someone comes to you and all you've ever seen is them play the same character and they want to play something different, you're going to be like, mm, I don't know. They might give a good audition, but it's not the same. I could just get this other person who always plays this character to play that character. Whereas, you know, I've seen Sylvester Stallone and, and Ryan Reynolds do roles that are completely different than what they've been typecast as. Comedians, for instance, are a real wealth of that ability. You look at Robin Williams, who played, you know, the fast-talking, jimmer-jammering kind of comedian character in so, so many films, and then would come out of completely left field with something like Goodwill Hunting. And 
they can do it. Comedians, for instance, I, I think are, are very, very good at that because they understand a lot of human nature, which leads into my next point, which is that those two types of actors aside, in order to be the one where you change different characters a lot, you have to have a really, really good ability to observe. Understanding's not quite enough because you can understand someone and not be able to, you know, regurgitate that behavior. You really need to be able to sit back and watch. And in my experience, most people in a given conversation aren't watching or really even listening to what the other person says past the major point. They're just going, what am I going to say next? This person has, has said this thing. And in order to be engaged in the conversation, I need to say something else. So about 60% of the given silent time in a conversation is the listener thinking about what they're going to say next and not actually observing what their counterpart is doing and saying. Does that make sense? Mm. I kind of went off on a bit of a brain tangent there because your little sister, surprisingly enough, has just watched Harry Potter 6, 7 and 8 for basically the first time since they came out. And she's discovered just how amazing they are. So we've got to sit down every evening now and watch them again on repeat, (laughs) which I don't mind. But what came up for me was Helena Bonham Carter in Harry Potter 8, where Hermione playing Bellatrix, and she did it really well. She's a really good observer of other people, Helena Bonham Carter, and she can do the voice and everything, which is just I find just amazing. But mm-hmm. she could she got all those tiny little movements that you were talking about just down. So you knew it was Emma Watson. Yeah. Uh, it's really a cornerstone of being able to switch between characters. It's not the only thing that you require as an actor, but it's an incredible tool to use to become much more nuanced. Because if you can't regurgitate what other people have said to a different enough extent, you're just you're just playing yourself. You're only painting with one colour palette, if you get my meaning. Mm. How did you do that then? Because you've always been an observer as a child. You, you all, I remember you sitting in your pram, sucking your thumb, and you were watching your brother. And at the time it was you were watching your brother so you knew what not to do because you knew he was always getting in trouble. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, that was that was long before I started training for acting. So happily, observation is a skill that, that I honed over many years of, of watching him. But there are a lot of exercises. Schools of acting are all different methods of trying to train someone to be not themselves, <laughs> basically. So uh, one of the most famous directors of the 20th century, one of his favorite things to do was what he called the silent etude. You go out into a space and you'd find someone whose physicality or emotions were different to everyone else's. And you would just observe them. The purpose of it was entirely about getting everything about them down. You wanted to mimic them perfectly. Everything about their posture, their gestures, the tone of voice, their expression, everything down so that you could regurgitate it for an audience and it would be completely different to you. The silent etude is a cornerstone of of what he was trying to achieve as a director. And it's something that we were taught at university and that I didn't do because I completely forgot about it until the day before and then I, I made something up. And you can tell, you can tell when someone makes it up because it's, It's one of those things that if you try to make it up, if you try to make up the way that someone else moves, you will only use your own gestures to try to make someone else. And it becomes painfully obvious what you're doing because it's everyone's physicality, everyone's voice, everyone's gestures are all a a convoluted mess of rubber bands that pull against one another in a very unique way. It's all part of a puzzle. It's, it's the cogs that turn to make a machine that's completely individual to them. Whereas if you try to substitute your own cogs, you'll make a machine, regardless of whether or not you were intending to, that moves similarly to your own machine. 
which is why the silent attitude is, is so important. There's several ways of doing it, but that's one of the most basic tools to actually legitimately training yourself to take on different physicalities. Did you ever actually do that? Yes, I, I have done it since. <laughs> <laughs> I have done it since. And it's actually now one of my favourite tools to train actors because it's something that people don't think is really, really necessary. And it's something people don't realise, I think, when they go out to, say, the shops or the, the movies or even just kind of sit in a park you think of everyone as moving and expressing and gesturing the same way you do. One of the constant arguments you get in the theatre, which is becoming more and more of a realism kind of focused genre, particularly in Australia, is that people think that everyone moves in the same realistic way, which is a very small kind of brought back gestures, not big expressions. You're being very kind of cool and calm and collected and small, which is something that really comes from television because you can focus on someone's expression in television and literally zoom in to show the audience what they should be looking at in a given moment. Whereas when a person expresses themselves, it's with the entire body. You know, when I make a point and my hands go out, it's not just my hands. You know, I lean back, I shift my weight on my hips, my chin goes up. It's a whole body movement that's not just focused on one part of the body. And when you make those gestures smaller, you not only limit your, your ability to express yourself, but you cut out an entire portion of the population who doesn't do that. Because you think that just because you gesture in that way, no one else does. Whereas if you go out and you observe people, you'll notice that everyone has different levels of how big they express themselves. Most people are fairly low, but I think every so often you'll encounter someone whose gestures are just completely out of this world. They're enormous. They're strange. They're the Willy Wonkers of, you know, ordinary life. But when you meet them in real life, it doesn't seem genre breaking to watch them because it's just so natural to them to do that. Whereas if I am to, you know, make big gestures, it feels performative. Because when I express myself, it's generally in a very, very particular way. My hands move and my head moves at the same time. That's the gesture I make. <laughs> so that's just one way to think of how different people can be, the size of their gestures. But it's, it's so much more than that. Each gesture, each emotion transitions to another in specific ways according to specific people. Micro expressions, for instance, uh, a huge part of being able to communicate with other people. And many humans do not share the same kinds of micro expressions for particular transitions. So, what, micro expressions what do you mean are transitions. So, micro expressions are expressions that last for less than a second, generally speaking, right? They're very, very small. And so, most expressions that we're aware of are like, you know, happy. Or, you know, concentrating or, you know, curious, that kind of thing. Those expressions last for entire conversations, generally speaking. If someone is happy, it affects their face for a really, really long time. Whereas if someone's concentrating, they'll keep it like that often for a long time. Micro expressions are much smaller and oftentimes happen under generally two conditions. The first is if something surprising happens, someone enters a room, someone says something, you are actually surprised because something explodes. That's the first one. Surprise lasts less than a second. Most of the other times are transitions between emotions. Someone says something, you react, and then you transition into a different emotion. The transitions are micro expressions, and they are designed to communicate between people effectively, efficiently, and very, very quickly. But with a kind of nuance that words don't have. We don't really have too many words that can express the full scale of true emotion. You know, if we are surprised, 
How many different flavors of surprise are there? How many different contexts for surprise could there possibly be? And that's just a large emotion. If we talk about moving from surprise to happy, you know, how many different variations of that are there? How many are colored by regret or sorrow or anger? You know, there's all these different nuances to expression. And everyone has different micro expressions because they are supposed to communicate what's happening in your brain. And everyone has a different brain. I feel like I shouldn't have to explain that. Listeners, everyone has a different brain. <laughs> so everyone has different micro expressions. Point A, point B. I've connected the dots. This is still jumping, but I'm going to plow on <laughs> and we'll see how it see goes. Better. Yeah. And Listeners, if you haven't watched the TV series Lie to Me that came out about 10 years ago, you need to watch it because that is all about the micro expressions. 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, God. Anyway, in order to be an effective actor, you need to be able to portray what is basically someone else's micro expression. It's not generally taught like that. Micro expression is a very modern term. Uh, that's been developed by psychologists. But we have all, all these different schools of acting that are designed to make you as a body and as a person regurgitate someone else's soul, question mark, because it's not just their physicality. It's, it's their being, yeah, the way they exist in a physical space. Mm. So some schools are focused on doing it from the inside out. You focus on visualization exercises. You focus on honing the mind so that it can exist in a way that is absolutely different from the way that it exists as you. For instance, um, Heath Ledger, in order to prepare for his role as the Joker, locked himself in a room for a month and kept a diary in which he became increasingly like the Joker in order to hone his ability to portray that character. That is one of the most common methods. In fact, it's known as the method. It's it's very, very popular, particularly amongst screen actors, but it is like any method of acting. It can be very, very dangerous. Trying to split your consciousness into two different states of being can have many unintended side effects. Um, it's not. <laughs> well, well, quite. <laughs> that, was, that was where I went when you said that. <laughs> There are ways to do it. Don't get me wrong. You just, you have to be very, very careful. If you do it poorly, you'll get a lot of feedback because we are who we are for very good reason. It's not an accident that each of us has a different personality. We are the sum total of not just our nature, our genetics, but also our environment. And from long before we can remember, babies have personality that is based entirely on the very, very simple cause and effect relationship they have with the world around them. If it's bright, they cry. If it's dark, they probably cry. It's babies. But because they have different associations from the day that they're born, their personality becomes different. I'm naturally more observant and pensive, I think, than, say, my brother it's just something that happened from even the day that we were born i've always been karma <laughs> uh he would probably argue with the karma part but that's something i've learned over the last few years but when you try to disrupt something that you have been since the very beginning and you don't properly quarantine it you can have unintended side effects your body is supposed to have personality and it will regurgitate that personality. And it, if you don't keep it separate from everything very, very deliberately, things will start to leak from one personality to another. I was going to say that. It's got to be very, very difficult to compartmentalise. And how does it impact your actual true self and psyche? And Because it's always going to be, once you take that on board, it's always going to be there as an option, isn't it? It is. And I should put a disclaimer at this point. Most of the time, when people don't get the proper training on how to do this, the side effect is not that they create a rogue personality and they splinter their psyche. Most of the time, the side effect is, I'm talking almost exclusively, 
The side effect is they're just a bad actor. Because if you can't quarantine it properly on stage, your personality as the dominant personality will leak and the audience will be able to tell. That's generally what happens. It's only if you've done a really, 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 really good job making a new personality that it starts to challenge the original personality. If you're playing an angry character, a well-known side effect is that you become very irritable as a person. It's as simple as that. It's, you know, not that you develop a split personality per se. It just, it does leak. Mm -hmm. And while, for instance, that primary connection is quite common, more significant is the secondary connection. At one point in uni, I've told you this story, I played a wife beater. Mm -hmm. He was an awful, awful human being who was very, very charming and kind and charismatic to everyone except his wife, whom he was astonishingly cruel to. And not to toot my own horn, but I portrayed the character extremely well, to the point that several of my classmates said it was the best thing they'd ever seen me do, which is a nice compliment. But it meant that I had the immediate fallback of wondering if I was nice and kind and charming to everyone, but had the capacity to be truly awful to specific people. And it creates this kind of feedback loop. I didn't properly deal with those emotions. I said, for instance, my, my way of dealing with, with it on that was I'll do it on the night. I'll go 100% on the evening. And, and I did. And it was great to watch. But I made my cast members cry. I made my friends flinch. And I made myself cry. It wasn't very fun. It was a bad time. because there's still a small part of you, even when you're on stage, that is you're watching yourself in any given moment. And you will continue to watch yourself even when you're another human being, I, I guess is, is the way to put that. So you come off stage, and even though it's not you, the bit that was watching says it's still you. And if you come back and you've made a really complete character and it's very, very different from who you are, I think I am very, very different from, from that character, for instance. You'll still be like, you still realize you have the capacity to do that. If you can do it on stage, you can do it in real life. It's difficult to come to terms with that. It's keeping yourself emotionally healthy is a really, really big part of being a character actor. And there are, there are, yeah, there are a lot of side effects if you do it poorly. I know in, we, we talked about this yonks and yonks ago, I don't think on the podcast, but in Germany, don't they have legally the an actor is not fully responsible for their actions so many hours after they've finished acting? Yeah, I think it's about, it's about an hour after they've gone off stage. They can't be held accountable for any actions that they take towards a crime. I think it's it's like clinically insane. It is something like that. So, I mean, they'll still be charged, but it, they won't be, you know, criminally culpable. They'll be considered to be insane, which is interesting. It's, um, it's an interesting way of looking at it. And what would your take on that be, having gone through, because I know what you were like when you were playing that character, <laughs> and you did avoid us. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Everyone reacts differently. My reaction because it was a negative reaction because there was there was a big feeling of shame there meant that I tried to avoid people no matter what show you're in when you finish there's always a feeling of elation and I think it, there is a disconnect there that, that varies from person to person and from how much they put into a given show I think that it is fair to say that they are insane if they commit a crime an hour after a show. But that would be more to do with the fact that they've come off stage and immediately decided to commit a crime. And I think personally, that's insane. They should go home and sleep. Yeah. I think if if they do immediately go into immediately go and do a crime, they've either planned it beforehand or it is the immediate result of that change in psychology. I, I can't see them unless they're a really bad actor. It's it's one of those things. I think it's fair to say that, but it depends. It depends on the person. 
you know, if they've got a history of acting like that, great. You've got your prior cause. But um, it's, it's an odd one. It's an odd one. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that is this called method acting? Is, this, is that what this is or is that something different? Because you were saying uh, there's two different schools. Oh, there's so many different schools. Oh. Listeners, there's <laughs> so many different schools. So <laughs> method <laughs> acting, as, as it's said by, you know. It's, so that's uh, it's, character acting, is it? Uh, no, character acting is, is, oh. is when you take on a different character when you put yourself in the shoes of a different actor. Method acting is a, is, is a method of acting in which you, in order to completely sort of regurgitate someone else in preparation, you surround yourself with the environment uh, that, that they have, basically, in order to as accurately as possible portray them as a character. That has extended to being the character, even off stage or off screen. It's a hip thing to do. It's dangerous, not just for yourself, but for people around you doing that kind of thing because it's, I mean, I say dangerous. It's selfish. It's rude because everyone has different methods. And if you're going around, generally speaking, method actors are playing assholes. That's generally how it works. There are a few exceptions to the rule that I will accept. Tom Hanks in Castaway, for instance, I will accept method acting. That's a really significant and specific psychology. And being isolated, I think, requires a certain preparation of isolation because it affects the way that you express yourself. Whereas if you're method acting in order to you know, prove a point or to be an, an asshole, there is a point at which it goes too far. But method acting comes from Stanislavski's school. Again, I won't name all of these methods. There's so many of them, listeners. There's so many different methods. I studied this for three years and I haven't even scratched the surface. But the idea is that it comes from within. So you surround yourself with a given environment. And in doing so, you start to create a character that is a product of the environment and of your imagination. So generally speaking, in order to become a method actor, you can never really Put yourself in exactly the same position as the character. So there is a large, you know, amount of, of imagination that goes on. You have to build it from the inside. Uh, it's it's very popular. It's not as popular for the stage, but I think one of the reasons it is so popular is that film doesn't rehearse properly. For a stage show, you need rule of thumb about one hour of rehearsal for every minute on stage. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> uh, that's the rule of thumb we, we have to go with. Whereas for film, you generally, you've got a few, you've got to read through. You might work on a couple of scenes with your co-work, co co-workers, but then you just go straight into filming and you do the scene over and over and over until you get it right. So I can understand why method acting has evolved as a method, of, as a way of dealing with that requirement that's placed on them you know what I, I mean whereas for stage because it's rehearsal based because you spend so much time in rehearsal before you go on stage because not only do you have to do it perfectly the first time you have to be able to do it exactly the same way again and again and again and again and again so it requires very different skills from film to stage i remember you saying to me a while ago that it must have been when you were first thinking about doing acting one of the schools I don't know whether it's NIDA or Whopper they you didn't want to go there because they kind of disassemble your personality that's part of their methodology of teaching you to act what's that it's, about that's fairly common honestly uh, at the time NIDA was infamous for it and each school goes through different waves of, of how much they kind of, of do that. But a lot of schools take pride in the fact that they take in people and they break them so that they no longer have a distinct physicality associated with themselves. The idea is if you break them into the associated parts, they can rebuild themselves in a way that is theoretically, they can rebuild themselves according to a character. 
But generally speaking, what happens is a lot of the schools will break you so that you no longer have your particular style of acting and then train you specifically to do things precisely how they do it. So you te- you're taught a very specific method that's associated with that given school, which doesn't sound fun to me. When I did theater, it wasn't an acting school. It was a theater degree. It was, it was history of theater, methods of acting, and an understanding of direction and com- composition, lighting and sound design, script writing. It was the whole kind of picture, which meant that we weren't really taught how to act. We were taught what's involved in the various methods, and we, we tried them out. The method by which I train my actors nowadays is sort of a hodgepodge Frankenstein's monster collection of the things that I've seen in different methods because we weren't taught to act. We were taught to read, <laughs> I suppose is the best way to put that. Um, so how did you learn to act then? We had exercises. So, I mean, it was okay, it was three years. You know, it's not over the course of an afternoon. So we did go into a fair amount of detail when dealing with specific directors. So a lot of the methodologies, for instance, of the 20th century had changed into very, very different schools of movement. And we went further back as well. We went to Renaissance Italy. We went to ancient Greece. You go to medieval, you know, Germany. You go to uh, archaic Japan or, or China. Everywhere has different methods of dealing with how to get people to act on stage. And we studied them generally for about a week at a time, and we're assessed on our understanding of those schools. And generally, the assessments were acting according to that school. So, for instance, when we studied Stanislavski, one of the largest directors of the 20th century, we did the silent etude. That was what we were marked on. We went out, we did the etude, and we came back. Because it's such a cornerstone of his method, it gave us a real insight and understanding, as well as the essays that we would write on how he worked and whether that worked for us. And then we would move on to, say, Meyerhold, a different director who works mainly with how to get the physicality of your body to affect the personality of the body. So you work instead of from the inside out, from the outside in, a very, very different method of doing things. And again, we'd be given a different exercise that was based on his understanding of how you would achieve that. And so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then when you finish that first unit, which was 10 weeks and 10 different directors, you do another semester, another 10 weeks, another 10 different directors. And that was one strand of units in the first year. And then in the second year, you would go on and you would choose a specific director and you would start kind of compiling a a deeper understanding of what they would do. You start finding their more complex methods. And then in third year, you have to direct something of your own, which means you have to train your actors to do a specific character. And so you now have an understanding of a a very wide field of directors and a more specific focus on the ones that work best for you. And you have to see not only how you're going to teach that to other people, but how other people react better to specific directors that aren't necessarily your own. And that was how we were taught. And how does that compare to what you, you'd be taught, say, at NIDA? See, and that's the thing. At NIDA, what they do is, and again, I haven't done a NIDA course. This is from me speaking to other people. At what, what they do at NIDA is they put you through grueling physical and mental exercise until you react the same way to the same things so that you, everyone, is broken down so they don't have a preference for a particular school. And then they build you back up so that you react to certain things in a certain way. Everyone comes out with the same school of thought. The process of breaking means that you no longer have a preference for a particular kind of school, which is fine. It's faster than the original method, but I think it's lazy. Why lazy? Because it assumes everyone's the same. And it assumes that a single approach applied to everyone will be stronger for having been applied to everyone. Whereas in my experience, any given project, 
in any given creative endeavor, any given theater production is stronger for having different perspectives. The more perspectives you have, the more of an understanding you have of how an audience can view it and how it will be seen. And it's true that there needs to be a uniformity, a sort of a level that everyone remains at so that the world of the play is consistent for the audience, which is the director's job. I don't believe that it is the director's job to micromanage the actors and tell them where they need to be at every given moment. I believe it's the director's job to take disparate actors, say seven or eight of them, who all have a different understanding of the text and push them in the same direction so that they kind of come together and they orbit one another with their different understandings of the text and their different understandings of acting so that they make something that is cohesive and complex to watch rather than breaking them down and building something that is just what I see. Yes, that basically sums up the Ryan School. <laughs> uh, I'm actually going to um, finish there because this is dropping out again. Um, we've yeah. got more than one episode in there, or we've got a good episode in there. I could talk easily for several days. <laughs> well, well I d- there is a lot more that I want to go through with this because we haven't even touched on what we were going to talk about, really. We've just covered the basics here, haven't we? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> There, I, there's so much to talk about. There really, really is. Yeah. Um, and I do want to talk about, yeah, the whole, because that that ability to be able to get into somebody else's life is actually something that we all need to do in order to understand people, you know, see that from somebody else's viewpoint. So it's, mm, See, that's a whole other program. How does that impact you as a person in the rest of your life or does your own personality still come into it? And if you're a selfish narcissist, you're going to stay a selfish narcissist. Honestly, that's just the tip of the problem because a big part of the problem is who is the person you want to portray. When you read a given script and you can put something together from the words, that might be the character that you want to portray. But then you talk to the director, and then they have a different vision. But then you as a person will also have a different understanding of how you in a given situation would act. And then, for instance, then you interact with your cast members, and they have a different method of interaction that's different from the one you were expecting them to be, which means that the person that you are reacts to different stimuli than the person that you were expecting to be. So then it's not only a question of how you become someone, but which person you become, which adds to the confusion. Yeah, you're not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Let's finish it up there for today and we'll continue this next time. Let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted and rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends, please. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you're leaving with some great ideas that can make a difference in your everyday life. Until next time.